For this month's county informational tape, we present a question asked of Devon Woodland during a talk show on radio in Colorado. Woodland had appeared in Chicago also on NBC's station WMAQ, and he was on KOA Denver during the National Western Stock Show. The excerpt we bring you now is from KAVI, Rocky Ford, Colorado. The talk show host, Pat McGee, is asking this question. Anytime you read anything about the NFO, you hear anything about the NFO, collective bargaining and National Farmers Organization is intertwined. It's synonymous. Now, mm -hmm. how does the collective bargaining work with the farm? And, of course, we hear about it in the unions, uh, the auto you know, the big strikes with the auto companies and, and things like this are always talking about collective bargaining. That has big, been a big stance of all unions since day one. Mm -hmm. How does this work with the farmer? It isn't a foreign term anymore, and it isn't controversial in agriculture. We see it all in our society. Every mm -hmm. group uses it. School teachers, firemen, the law enforcement people. Everybody. Everybody uses it. But agriculture has not embraced that principle totally mm -hmm. or enough. Now, anyone knows that you have power in number and your strength is in volume. For example, the school teachers, uh, they have man hours to sell to the consuming public. And they put those man hours together and then go in and negotiate a contract. In agriculture, you don't put your man hours together per se, but you put the product of the man hours together, which may be uh, grains, it may be livestock, it may be uh, farm commodities that you convert from man hours into commodity. And then because of that volume, you have some ability to negotiate contracts. So you collect the commodity together that you have for sale, collect it, and then you go into the bargaining phase. You sit down with the user and you negotiate a contract with him. And then that contract, if not today, tomorrow, or next month, eventually you want it to reflect in agriculture your costs of producing the goods. And that must be and agriculture has not been able to uh, protect itself at the marketplace because you have an organized buying system in your major companies buying from a disarray, disorganized, fragmented producers. For example, in grain, they're called the big five. About five, they control not only the domestic, but the international markets. Okay. And then you have in dairy uh, about three, and in meat you have about four, five, two. And so these people have a, a buying structure that they operate off from, and uh, agriculture, farmers, producers, they must organize themselves so that they have some ability to protect their economic interests with these procurement people. Devon Woodland, appearing on the talk show called Party Line on KAVI Rocky Ford, Colorado. Now let's talk to Tom Schweers, operator of one of the best-known livestock collection points in the NFO, the one at Ireland, Indiana. How's it going, Tom? It's been going very well. Over a number of years, we continue to show improvement. We get better packer acceptance on a regular basis, better farmer acceptance. We are becoming very well known in our area. Why this better acceptance now? Well, I'll say the better acceptance by the farmers is our service. We can assist farmers in so many ways now, from the grading yield to the forward contracting. We have programs that uh, will apply to to most every one of them. Tell about this Ireland-Indiana collection point of NFO. Tell about it. It's been in operation since the late 60s. It uh, services the area along Interstate 64 in southern Indiana. It uh, handles livestock from Dubois, Davies, Spencer, Perry, Pike, Martin counties are the main counties that we, we service. Last year, 1982, we ran approximately 70,000 head of hogs, somewhere around uh, 6,000 head of fat cattle, and about the same number of feeder cattle. For the the way you describe that, Tom, this is a pretty heavy production area, isn't it, for livestock? In the state of Indiana, it very much is. Uh, there is a lot of counties in the state of Iowa or areas in Iowa that carry as much livestock as what that area is. But for that area, in a small area in the state of Indiana, it is very much livestock. So when you say there's better acceptance, you're in a position to see it. Definitely. Yes, definitely. Because the amount of livestock that's there, the number of uh, other buying stations that there are in that immediate area, uh, which there's a lot of them, 
you know, we do very well, have a very good market, are accepted very much. Tom Schwears, operator of the Ireland-Indiana Collection Point. We're going to talk about the NFO's National Reserve Grain Block and how it's going. Ray Jurgison, Director of Operations for the Grain Department of National Farmers, is here to review the progress to date. Ray, I know that there are many grain growers who look on this block as an opportunity, and they like it. What's the objective of it? Well, the objective, Phil, is to put all of this organized grain, in other words, the three-year reserve grain has been organized by the government, to put that organized grain behind one voice. purpose of putting it behind one voice is to ensure that when release level is reached, that we don't have somewhere in excess of 3 billion bushels trying to go into the market within a 30-day or very short period. Our goal is to pre-negotiate contracts for orderly flow into the market to prevent market collapse at time of release. How's it going? Well, it seems to be going excellently. You know, we spend a lot of time uh, kicking it off in the Dakotas, Minnesota, Kansas, Nebraska, Michigan, and Ohio, and we have, in effect, in the last 30 days, doubled the sign-up uh, of what we had achieved in the previous 90 days. So it's had a nice snowball effect. Do you have any examples on the scene? Well, I think we could talk to Leland Townsend, who's been working out in southern uh, Michigan and Ohio, and he's got a, a pretty favorable report there. We enroll some new membership. Some of them went with the volume and sending program, but all of them were interested in our reserve block. And we signed up 450,000 bushels one afternoon in the reserve block. These large growers, and one of them had 4,400 acres of corn that enrolled in the NFO, and uh, we got his free stock signed up also. And uh, he was very much interested in the orderly movement of the reserve block. He says that's going to be the key to put the floor under this market. Do you think that they signed because they are looking for a kind of an alternative that they couldn't find elsewhere? Farmers, I think, are feeling, these large growers, that if they don't do something in another year, that they're going to be trapped in government programs. And they want one designed by themselves, which the NFO offers a farmer self-help program. Leland Townsend with the NFO Grain Department in Michigan and Ohio. Well, Ray, are you encouraged about this whole prospect? Definitely, Phil. I think one of the nicest things that's happened to us is to see the vast numbers of new people that have gotten enrolled in our program. And, of course, that's the sign we've been looking at and looking for for quite some time. Grain producers who are in the farmer-held grain reserve are signing up their production under an orderly contractual marketing program. Let's hear Mark Rubin of the state of Washington. He tells how the Pacific Northwest is doing. We've had a very successful grain program the last three to four years. This year, our volume increased about 20% over a year ago, and this is taking into consideration that uh, one of the major counties that we operate in was the highest participant in the nation as far as participation in the grain program, as in the ASC program, which was a 15% reduction in wheat acreage. So this uh, would cut back 15% under normal circumstances, but we actually increased 20%. So we, we did have a, a fairly respectable growth in the past year. I'd say that's remarkable, considering the fact that they were big the year before. Why do you think it is, Mark? Well, I think the recognition that uh, the farmers realize that we do have a viable program and that we everyone that participates in the program through program marketing uh, ends up with their grain sold in the top 30 percent of the market where the average is 90 percent of it sold in the bottom 30 percent are you hopeful for the coming months in the sign-ups under this program i think very much uh, we happen to be in an area where we can move grain at about the equal to the reserve prices. So we do have uh, fairly good amounts of grain moving through this time of the year. As time goes on, I think it will begin to slow down until we get some price recovery that will bring the, the grain out of reserve. Mark Rubin from the state of Washington. Another of NFO's programs is in Caldera Cows. This is not only a satisfactory bargaining program for members, it's also a constructive step in reducing overall milk production. We hear Bill Jones, new NFO board member from Michigan. We've made a lot of, a lot of gains in cull cows. The collection point at Cass City, we've taken it from two years ago 
They were only running about 350 head of cattle, and uh, at the end of December for 82, we run 2,000 through there. So it is a gain. Bill Jones, NFO board member from the state of Michigan. The NFO cow dairy cow program has been praised for its bargaining power and for its active culling of production. And I'm talking to Gene Stotts of Packerland. Gene Stotts at one time complimented national farmers on being a supplier. On a, on a scale of 10, maybe NFO rated a 9 as being a dependable supplier. You said that they're working to put together blocks of Holsteins now. Talk about that. Well, Packerland in the state of Wisconsin is trying to develop uh, a program where we could secure another 100,000 head of cattle for Packerland Packing Company for our growth program, for one thing, and probably to, to secure a more profitability for the farmers, and hopefully that we can, uh, in the future, uh, give the farmer more money for his product. And this is what we're trying to develop right at the moment at Packland Packing Company. We do believe in NFO, and we're very cooperative with them. I think the time is uh, here that we can do many things together where we couldn't achieve it uh, a few years back. Gene Stotts, president of Packerland of Green Bay, Wisconsin. National Farmers Organization has a supply contract with his firm, and as you just heard, he believes in improving the situation both for his own processing industry and for the farmers who supply him. Al Scott, director of dairy for NFO, will explain an action by national farmers to stop making the 50-cent deductions called for in the much-discussed taxing measure which was launched by USDA. Al Scott. National Farmers Organization will not make the 50-cent deductions from the milk checks of our dairy farmers and will immediately refund the 50-cent deduction previously made under USDA regulations. Why is the NFO taking this action? We're doing this in light of the injunction against the milk tax by a South Carolina federal district judge. It was issued by United States District Judge Matthew J. Perry of Columbia in a suit brought initially by state agencies and others. Well, what's the reasoning behind it? Judge Perry sustained one of the contentions being argued by NFO in its own suit against the Secretary of Agriculture. It says the Secretary's rule to go ahead with the tax is null and void because he violated the Administrative Procedure Act. Why has the NFO been fighting the milk tax? We can quote Judge Perry himself when he issued the injunction. He said he was gravely concerned that harm will follow from a collection of the 50-cent deduction if the secretary is allowed to proceed and that farmers will suffer irreparable injury. The only thing we could add is that we NFO recognizes that when a dairy farmer is faced with reduced income, such as this tax will bring about, he will respond by trying to increase production. And that's exactly the opposite of the stated purpose of this tax. Al Scott, director of dairy for NFO. You have heard the informational tape service to the county organizations of National Farmers Organization, compiled and edited by Don Mack, head of the broadcast division. I'm Phil Allen, and that for this month is something to think about.